In case you miss it, here's a sports animal rewind. Let's talk college football. It's time for the Sports Page Summer of College Football, presented by Buddy Greg RVs and Motorhomes, our daily preview of teams and conferences around the country for the upcoming college football season. Find Buddy Greg RVs and Motorhomes on their Facebook page, their website at BuddyGreg.com, and follow them on Twitter at BuddyGregRVs. Now let's take a look at the Alabama Crimson Tide. To help us break down Alabama today, we bring in an old friend, a young old friend, former colleague Andrew Gribble, now writes for AL.com, all the papers in Alabama, and you can find him on Twitter at Andrew underscore Gribble. Andrew Gribble joins us right now. Hey, Andy, Vince, and Brendan. How you doing, Andy? I'm doing great. How you guys doing? We're good. We're good, man. We um, Let's start sort of with, uh, with the, the big picture where Alabama is right now, you know that a couple of years ago when Alabama won that won their their first national championship in the stretch, the year after Nick Saban didn't really feel like his team was is hungry, is motivated, and they ended up losing three games that next year. Do you see now after back to back championships? Do you see any of the similar type of comments or concerns from Nick Saban? You know, I think at this point in the off season that uh, Nick Saban is always concerned about something, and he's made the point over and over again that you know he, uh, he if he if he was satisfied at this point in the off season that he you know he he wouldn't end up having a national championship winning team by the end of the year. So you know he always wants to see it as a work in progress, especially in at the end of the, the incident in the off season with the four players getting arrested and kicked off the team. I think that was uh, uh, kind of a, a thing that had. Since he's been here, and it, was, it served as maybe uh, a wake-up call for some for some of these players uh, in terms of kind of the, the uh, maybe the elite is elitism that these players that got picked up team had, thinking they could get away with anything, and you know really served as a, a humbling moment for the rest of the team, and kind of recentered the focus going into uh, spring workouts and spring football and going into the summer, but. You know, there's leaders on both sides of the ball that are, have really emerged and, and with A.J. McCarron at quarterback, uh, C.J. There's some others that are really starting to speak up and uh, have really organized these summer workouts. And, you know, really, it was around this time last year at SEC uh, Media Days where Nick Saban said, you know, the offseason was one of the best ones that they ever had. And you know, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see what he says uh, in a few weeks from now. But up until this point, he, he's kind of the, the same Nick Saban where, he, where he's never satisfied no matter, no matter what's happening. Well, and Andy, did you did you see anything in, in terms of this spring? I guess from the players that would have been different, or in terms of just quotes coming out of there, or, or anything like that that would say that the way that they were able to respond to the, the national championship two years ago and, and last year's off season, is, did you see any difference from the players? And I know some of there's some new faces, but there's a lot of the, the same guys around. Yeah, you know it's kind of tough to see because as you, you guys know, I mean these. <laughs> players that, that we're able to speak to are, are pretty polished and you know they, they they're, they're kind of like the guys I like to call the company men in terms of you know, they don't really say uh, too much controversial stuff to begin with and you know and they usually kind of repeat a lot of the same things and you know that's what Nick Saban wants from his players because he wants the message to stay on point but you know, I think the key players again are AJ McCarron and CJ Mosley who you know they're, they're two of the players who have actually you know were key members of uh, or on the the roster of that 2010 team that ended up falling short you know now you know the the main players in this team there are fewer and fewer members uh of this team who were even really around for 2010 and you know with Barrett Jones, Robert Lester, uh Michael Williams last year those are the last members of the 2008 signing class uh that were here so really you know the this whole team has really only been accustomed to, to winning at an elite level. Uh, and so the, the memories of 2010 are, are getting more and more faded. So I think that becomes even more of a challenge uh, for Nick Saban and his coaching staff to, to keep them focused and, and make them realize, you know, even though you are Alabama and you are the number one team in the country, uh, you're still able to get beat. And I think that, you know, ultimately the, they'll probably keep harping back to that loss to Texas A&M last year because they're, you know, you, you got to grasp at, at moments 
uh, of failure for this program to remind them that, that they can happen. Joined by Andrew Gribble, covers the Alabama Crimson Tide for AL.com. Andrew, I want to go position by position with you. You you do it well for AL.com. You used to do it well for us here on the show when we did it with Tennessee. Uh, let's start at the quarterback position with A.J. McCarron. The, the numbers last year were phenomenal, as you know. But what about how he can be better and then what they have backing up A.J. McCarron should he get hurt? Well, you know, I, I think it's going to be hard for him statistically to be much better than he was last year. I mean, it's, it, you know, the probability of football makes it almost impossible to throw fewer than three interceptions. And, you know, he really only threw those three interceptions in two games. Uh, so really when you look at it, he had 12 games without any interceptions. And, you know, he put up a bunch of yards, the most by pretty much any Alabama quarterback because of the way, uh, Alabama's offense is typically structured. But, uh, you know, it's going to be hard for him to do that as well just because, you know, you look at the schedule, uh, and you see a lot of games where he might be pulled out uh, before the third or fourth quarter. And, you know, so it, statistically it might be harder, but I think he, there's a lot of things he can maybe do uh, mechanically He's and just getting more and more comfortable with this offense in his third year uh, and his second year under offense coordinator Doug Nussmeyer. And, you know, really the interesting storyline all offseason here has been uh, what's the future at the position like? Alabama has a ton of backup quarterbacks, but really uh, not one that has emerged as uh, the guy you're going to look at in 2014. I think entering the year, Blake Sims uh, will probably be the number two quarterback on paper, uh, but that doesn't mean he'd be the quarterback of the future if A.J. McCarron had to miss a couple games. Uh, redshirt freshman Alec Morris uh, has really emerged as maybe that that guy if he had to pick one guy at the moment. But you know, there's time for players like Cooper Bateman, uh, who's a, who's a freshman, uh, and then even Luke Del Rio, uh, the son of Jack Del Rio, he's a walk on, uh, but he had a very good spring as well. So uh, that backup quarterback job will be interesting to watch throughout the year, and I wouldn't be surprised if you know Nick Saban has maybe a quicker hook with McCarron uh, just to get these guys in the game and know what he has for 2014. And now with uh, with McCarron's favorite target, uh, Amari Cooper, obviously shredded Tennessee last year, but coming in, doing what he did as a true freshman last year, how, how do you see his, his his sophomore jump in terms? He's obviously now a very known commodity. He was a high rank. What was he like five six? I think ranked among wide receivers going into last year. But you know, I, I don't know if anybody could have foreseen what he did last year. How, how do you see his sophomore jump? Yeah, it's, it's going to be statistically again. I think it might be tough, even though I think he's probably one of the better receivers in the entire country. It's just Alabama has never had this many wide receivers that they're able to count on. Uh, and with this offense, and A.J. McCarron likes to spread the ball around, even though uh, Amari probably became his, his favorite target by the end of last year. I, uh, I think uh, Amari Cooper, uh, he had a heck of a spring, and everyone said re- he really, among Alabama's quarter- cornerbacks, no one could really guard him uh, in spring football, and uh, he continues to do well over the summer. And uh, But there's just a lot of other guys that, that are going to be able to put up numbers. I think Kevin Norwood, uh, going into his senior season is, is a player that people overlook a lot, but he seems to emerge uh, in big games. And then there's redshirt freshman Chris Black is kind of uh, the mystery man because he missed all of last year with a shoulder injury, but he was the player who probably had a better spring than Amari Cooper last year uh, and, and was the, the higher-ranked player uh, coming out of high school. And he, he, he looks like someone that could really – uh, be big on third downs and really good in that slot receiver position. But then there's uh, a, a number of other guys like Christian Jones was good. Uh, Raheem Falcons was an early enrollee freshman. Uh, Robert Foster comes in this summer as the number two overall wide receiver in the entire country. So there's just there's a lot of a lot of players that, that are going to be vying for playing time a wide receiver, and that's why Nick Saban has moved a couple of them to defensive back because there, there's just no way they can get all these guys on the field. Andrew, talk about the running back position. T.J. Yeldon moves into that one spot. It's amazing that he seems like a, a one back, but shared the the carries with Eddie Lacy last year. But talk about Yeldon and then the depth behind him, which is pretty ridiculous as always. Yeah, there, there's a lot of guys there at that position, but you know, I, I could almost foresee it just because Yeldon is such a uh, everyone knows that he's kind of a special player at that running back position. I, I almost wonder if they're going to divide the carries kind of like the way they did in 2011, uh, where Richardson was clearly the number one guy and then uh, Lacey was number two, whereas last year Lacey and Yeldon really split carries down the middle. But uh, behind Yeldon, there, there's Kenyon Drake, who uh, somehow had five touchdowns and 300 yards out of the third or fourth string running back position last year. Uh, Derek Henry, uh, who enrolled early but broke the broke bone in his leg, he, he's someone that, that could be there uh, fighting for carries. There's Shelston Fowler, 
uh, who missed all of last year with an injury, but uh, he's a kind of a third down back at about 245 pounds. And then uh, there's three true freshmen that will be on campus uh, who already are, are on campus and, and will be around for August uh, at camp. Alti Tenpenny, uh, Alvin Kamara, and Tyron Jones. Uh, I think players have shown in the past if you're a freshman and you can carry the ball, uh, Nick Saban will put that trust in you. So there's going to be a lot of competition uh, for that second, third, and fourth spot. Uh, on Alabama's running back depth chart, and I wouldn't be surprised if one of the, one or two of those uh, freshmen ultimately have to redshirt. Obviously, I guess the only two real position questions of uh, not even concern really when it it comes to a program like Alabama, but that the questions are surrounding would be the O line and, and probably cornerback. So I want you to start on that O line there before uh, you know, just kind of feeding right off that that running back conversation. Yeah, you know, there's there there were two three positions up for grabs from last year. Uh, one of which uh, was basically inherited by Ryan Kelly at center. He's going to take over for Barrett Jones, and you know there's really no other competition at that position. But uh, a starting five basically emerged by about the tenth practice uh, in spring ball, and that was uh, Cyrus Quanjo is going to be back at left tackle, and then uh, at left guard, his brother uh, Ari Quanjo is, is probably going to take over for Chance Warmack uh, at that position. Ari's Ari's been hurt a lot throughout his career, but uh, is finally healthy and playing very well, and then. You have Ryan Kelly at center. Anthony Steen will be back at right guard. Uh, and then at right tackle, Austin Shepard uh, was a junior. He he beat out a junior college transfer, Leon Brown, and really kind of took over that right tackle position. And you know, they're, they're trying to develop depth in the position. And uh, new offensive line coach Mario Cristobal is really still trying to get used to what the, the talent he has and kind of uh, getting players that are versatile to, to maybe fill in multiple roles in the backup positions. And, uh, at cornerback, you know, there's there's going to be some question marks uh, because there's a lot of unproven guys. Uh, uh, replacing D. Milner is going to be very hard to do, uh, but uh, I think Dion Ballou, who started every game last year, will definitely be locked in on one side. And then uh, Geno Smith is a was a soft freshman last year that played a bunch. Uh, he's kind of maybe the heir apparent to D. Milner. He'll be on the other side of the field, and then. Uh, and that's you know that there's a, a number of other players. John Fulton is a senior, has a lot of experience, and uh, Cyrus Jones uh, was wide receiver last year, but came in as a five star athlete, and uh, he he might be a very uh, a regular at cornerback this coming year. So a lot of options. It's just a, as as it was last year in the secondary for Alabama. A lot of guys that that people haven't heard of, but, but we'll know by the end of the season. Andrew, let's go down. We're visiting with Andrew Gribble from AL.com, talking about Alabama this season. Talk about the uh, the defensive line and uh, and maybe getting more pressure on the quarterback and then also replacing Jesse Williams in the middle. Well, you know, with, with Jesse Williams in the middle, it looks like there's going to be a couple of guys. He, he was you know, probably the most underrated player in Alabama's entire defense last year, but uh, I think junior Brandon Ivory, uh, sophomore Darren Lake, uh, and then a couple others could potentially fill his spot at Nose Garden. Uh, a guy to watch is Jeffrey Pagan, uh, a former guy that Tennessee really wanted a couple years ago, ultimately, uh, went to Alabama. He's, uh, been a regular, uh, reserve for the last couple of years, and he's kind of gonna fill that role that Damian Square used to play. Uh, Ed Stinson is a, was led all defensive lineman last year in tackles for loss. He's back for his senior season. Uh, and then there's a number of guys, I think, uh, two to watch are LaMichael Fanning. Uh, and Dalvin Tomlinson, they're they're both kind of that speed end uh, rusher that you know that maybe a little bit lighter. I think Michael Fanning's drops about 20 pounds uh, to, to maybe get a little faster off the edge. And you know, really, the, it's going to go beyond the defensive line to create more pressure on the quarterback. But those two guys, uh, if they can kind of emerge as those fast twitch uh, pass rushers, which is something that Alabama did not have last year, uh, Alabama will be more dangerous at pressure on the quarterback, which is was maybe. Uh, one of their weaknesses uh, on defense last year. It, I guess in, it, it kind of developed over the year. The first, what, seven games or so, the defense was just ridiculous, and then you saw some teams actually put some points up on them. It seemed to, you know, mainly by having to go over the top against that secondary, with the secondary now being a little bit weaker, like you said, replacing D. Milner. Is that, I mean, in terms of the actual blueprint of beating this team, do, do you see it being a very similar thing to, to last year? I think the blueprint probably remains the same, but it, it might be tougher because I think with, with the way Alabama was getting beat last year, I think the weaknesses uh, were maybe up front that maybe made the, the back end look worse. Uh, I think really it comes down to what Alabama can get out of their linebackers, and I think C.J. Mosley is going to take on a bigger role uh, than he did last year. He was not even a regular starter last year, if you can believe it. He was, you know, he he would mostly be off the field on running plays, but I think they've added 
more speed at that linebacker position. I think Adrian Hubbard, uh, who's a potential first round pick is going to, is going to be better. I think Denzel Duvall will have a bigger role there. And, uh, really the, another guy that NFL scouts are really going to be watching all year is haha Clinton Dix, uh, at that safety position. He had five interceptions last year and, uh, really is, is going to kind of be kind of the focal point of that secondary, kind of, uh, getting a lot of comparisons already to Mark Barron, but, uh, I think he's a little bit better in pass coverage, maybe not as, as strong and run stopping as Mark Barron was. But yeah, I think the blueprint remains the same, but I think Alabama, through its recruiting, they've recruited a lot of kind of the, that fast hybrid linebacker defensive lineman type, uh, to kind of address those weaknesses and, uh, adjust to more and more teams going to that kind of Texas A&M, Ole Miss, Auburn style of offense. And, uh, that's, that's the way Alabama is kind of treating their personnel going forward. And that's the way they've, treated it with uh, this upcoming recruiting class and the, and the 2013 one. Andrew, uh, outside of the schedule, which we'll talk about in a second, what else is really important or noteworthy about this team, maybe even some freshmen that you think that you haven't mentioned that might be able to make an impact and, and uh, burst onto the scene that fans could uh, could kind of keep an eye on? Well, I, I think the first thing that offensively is, is Alabama, maybe not this year, but in, in, in next year could have kind of that playmaking tight end uh, that, that they really haven't had over the last couple of years, and that's with uh, five-star O.J. Howard. He was already on campus uh, in the spring, and uh, it would be a tough to ask him to do a ton this year uh, at that position. I think he's going to stay at the H-back. Uh, but going forward, I think, Al- I think Nick Saban, you know, obviously very close with Bill Belichick, wanted what the Patriots had before all this Aaron Hernandez, Rob Gronkowski stuff with the, the, the tight ends who could become – significant playmakers uh, in the offense. I think that's something that Alabama's looking at going forward and uh, really trying to get more production out of that position. Uh, and then I think looking at, at special teams are going to be interesting as well. Uh, there's a true competition right now at kicker uh, between Kate Foster and Adam Griffith. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if one guy handles all the responsibilities or if they'll split them uh, down the middle like they did last year with Kate Foster and Jeremy Shelley. But because uh, Kate, Kate Foster's proven to be good on long field goals but not as accurate on short field goals and uh, Alabama will, will need to replace Jeremy Selly, who was very good last year. Andrew, last thing. Talk about the schedule and what your expectation is, a prediction, if you've made one on Alabama this year. I mean, the schedule, as, as many people have pointed out, is as favorable as it's ever been. And it's it, it lines up so ideal for Alabama in terms of not only do they avoid uh, Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina, but their two toughest games, LSU and Texas A&M, uh, both have buys the week before them. And, uh, their big non-conference game against Virginia Tech uh, looked tough a couple years ago, but now Alabama enters it uh, as a 17-point favorite. So, uh, really, it all comes down to the game at, in, in, at Texas A&M. Uh, you've got to like Alabama's chances in that game just because uh, Nick Saban has probably been preparing for Johnny Manziel ever since that game last year, uh, and it'll be something that they've worked on all spring and all all, all throughout the offseason. So, it's it's hard to at this point. It really is hard to predict. Uh, an Alabama loss during the regular season. Uh, but, you know, when a team enters with a lot of expectations, it, it seems like we try to predict everything, and it looks so easy in, in the off season. but then things change, and uh, just like with USC last year. But I, I would predict Alabama right now, uh, it's really hard to pick a loss, and that's why Las Vegas hasn't picked them to lose in a, in a few years. Andrew Gribble covers the Alabama Crimson Tide for AL.com, at Andrew underscore Gribble. Do people still think you cover Tennessee? Yes, uh, all the time. Uh, it, it, it's so strange, and I, I wonder, you know, if you're on Twitter so infrequently, why are you even on Twitter? But you know, people uh, still still ask me when I moved when I moved to Tuscaloosa or when I started covering Alabama, and I have to remind them that it's been about a year and about four or five months now. Beautiful. Now, Andrew, I've been highly critical of the job Evan Woodbury has done as <laughs> as as the new UT beat writer. What do you think? Is doing all right? Yeah, I think he's holding his own. You know, he's, he's kind of coming into his own. He's, he's kind of at that redshirt freshman sophomore nice. stage. So, you know, we'll, I'll just nice. be looking out to see what he does this year. All right, Andy. Hopefully we'll get to talk to you at Media Days. We appreciate the time, Andy.